It's my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Pastor Stephen Brown. He has been privileged to serve in full-time ministry for over 25 years, from serving as a staff member all the way to being senior pastor. In 2011, he was elected to be the lead pastor of the Greater Life Church, formerly known as the Greater Bethlehem Church of East Dallas. Greater Life's mission is, you'll like this, to live the life we were created for. Simple and pretty straightforward, amen? Stephen has been fortunate to speak at numerous conferences, revivals, and crusades from South Dallas to West Africa. Formerly trained at Morehouse College and Dallas Theological Seminary, where he earned his Bachelor of Arts degree and his THM, respectively. Stephen also joined the staff of Dallas Theological Seminary's Office of Alumni and Career Services in 2019. He is joyfully married to Dr. Nicole T. Brown, and Dr. Nicole is here. If you would just wave your hand and let us recognize you, and thanks for being here. She is a pediatrician, and they have one son, Stephen Nicholas, who is 16, and one daughter, Simone Elise, who is 11 years old. Would you join me today in welcoming to our first summer chapel, Pastor Stephen Brown. What a joy it is to be with you on this, the Lord's Day. I want to first of all thank Pastor Joe for the invitation. Uh, I want to publicly give a shout out to our department, career services and alumni. So good to see you all in the house. All right. And my wife said, do not introduce her. Pastor Joe did. Thank you for that. <laughs> and I have a couple of members from my church, Greater Life. We're so blessed that you're here with us on today. If you find your copy of the scriptures and meet me in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is summer chap chapter, so I got to get at it, y'all. He gave me three minutes to preach, 2 Timothy <laughs> chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 8 in your hearing. 2 Timothy 2, verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead and descended from David, according to my gospel, <clears throat> for which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. This is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I want to speak from the topic, remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. Christ. If I were at my church, I'd give what's called the big idea. The big idea for today's message is this. Jesus went through so we could come through. Jesus went through so we could come through. Our faith gains its strength through Jesus. Our hope is rooted in Jesus. Our love is revealed by Jesus. Remember Jesus. My mom was quite the decorator. She lavished our home with a blend of both antique and modern furnishings. Her most, her most prized possession was her linen tablecloths. I know they were linen because I had to iron them. Atop each of her linen tablecloths covering her antique dining table was a crystal bowl filled with mixed fruit, apples, grapes, bananas, pears, and peaches. It was an array of delightful fruit. But watch this. The fruit was fake. It looked the part. It it looked real in both color, size, and shade. A, a cursory glance would affirm that it was, in fact, fruit. But if you took a bite, then you'd know. Friends, can you imagine taking a bite of fake fruit? See, the Apostle Paul has been prepping Timothy and us 
about the reality of fake fruit, fake truth, fake preaching, fake preachers. It, it looks real, it sounds real, but if you would just take a bite, then you'd know. Beloved, do you realize that it's possible to have artificial church that looks real? It's, it's possible to be an artificial Christian, but look real. See, my time today will not permit me to chase fakes, chasing silly myths and the lies of liars, says Paul. Now, this time is for proclaiming God's word and then committing that same word to faithful men and women, that's you, who will be able to teach others also. As a matter of fact, is there anybody in the house who has committed themselves to the real? The Lord has been too faithful to you. He's been too committed to you for you to walk away nibbling fake fruit. The whole hymn declares, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest flame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Go ahead and say amen if you feel it. Come on. Remember Jesus. Chapter 2 opens with the Apostle Paul challenging timid Timothy about the necessity of strength. Not of his own strength, but the strength that is found in the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The strength that is unending, that will not run out because God's grace is so faithful. Then Paul introduces Timothy to the reality of pain. Somebody say pain. pain. Come on, look at your neighbor and say pain. pain. Y'all going to be Baptists before I finish. Amen. <laughs> pain, pain, pain in life. Pain as a result of your faith. Pain. Do you know that in order to experience purpose and fulfillment in Christ, you'll have to go through? E.K. Bailey puts it this way. He says that God cannot use you greatly until he has hurt you deeply. Perhaps our pain and suffering will never mimic Paul's pain and suffering or that of the early church. But please make note, beloved, our faith, God's word, and our Lord are under attack. There are sects and cults that are infiltrating the Lord's church, and we must prepare for some pain. Now, in our text for today, Paul gives Timothy the source of his strength, the, the, the one who will enable Timothy to endure suffering like a soldier, the one who will empower Timothy to compete as a skilled athlete, the one who will endow Timothy with, with skill and training of a farmer to harvest, and the one who will give purpose. To Timothy's pain. Who is that? Remember Jesus Christ. Here's a helpful observation from my text, and I really want you to take this home on today. Christ makes chaos make sense. Christ makes chaos make sense. In our couplet of verses, which is actually one sentence in the Greek, Paul is teaching Timothy and us that suffering is a prerequisite for glory. Look at verse 8 again. It says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead and descended from David according to my gospel, for which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. This is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Ah. Amen. <laughs> Siri is heckling me. I love it. <clears throat> Don't say that name. No one say that name. <laughs> Friends, as we navigate... This culture of confusion, as people of faith, as we faithfully share truth to a world overflowing with error, 
As we live daily to honor the Lord with humility and holiness, we will suffer. Someone asked C.S. Lewis, why do the righteous suffer? Why not, he exclaimed. They're the only ones who can take it. We will suffer because Jesus suffered. Jesus was abandoned, beaten, lied upon. How bad did it get? Well, Scripture records that he died. And in my Baptist voice, I say he died until the sun refused to shine. The son of God sent to earth, rejected and scorned, died for our place and died for our mess. He died. It was the ultimate sacrifice. This is why in Luke chapter 4, our shared enemy tempted Jesus to bypass Calvary's cross. He told Jesus that if Jesus would bow down and worship him, that that Jesus would then receive his kingdom and his glory. But, But if Jesus bypassed the cross, friends, if he avoided his suffering, then our debt would still be outstanding. What debt, Pastor Brown? The debt of our sin, the the gulf separating us from the Father. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't bypass Calvary's cross? Uh, The song said, no cross, no crown. Paul says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Friends, our first movement for today is Christ's victory. Christ's victory. Victory. Being raised from the dead demonstrates Jesus' power over death, hell, and the grave. Being raised from the dead gives every blood-bought believer that same victory. But don't miss it, beloved. Jesus had to go through so we could come through. This is what makes our faith so significant, Christ's victory. That's not all we see. Secondly, text says he descended from David according to my gospel. Not just Christ's victory, also Christ's history. Christ's history. Now Paul is simply highlighting a few components about Jesus Christ. These are two markers that were likely a part of a creed spoken in Paul's day. But the fact remains that Jesus Christ is the Davidic Messiah that was prophesied about and promised to us. We find in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus' human heritage is meticulously delineated so that our Jewish friends would be convinced Jesus checked the box of every prophetic marker. He fulfilled all the promises made about the soon coming Messiah. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, our Savior, and our Lord. Can I get one witness up in here? Christ. Victory, Christ's history, but the text is moving. Paul says, for which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal. Next, we see Paul's testimony. Friends, Paul is in bondage. He is imprisoned in a Roman jail. Paul is talking about freedom while he's on lockdown. And notice, it it was personal. Paul says, my gospel, uh, the gospel that Paul had received and embraced, preached and suffered for, Paul made it personal. But notice, Paul was bound like a criminal because he was not, in fact, a criminal. Paul, like Christ, was falsely accused. He was found guilty of innocence. He he was held captive. Why? Because suffering is a prerequisite to glory. We must be willing to suffer even the slightest inconvenience so that the Lord will get the glory. See, the reason a woman can endure the pain of childbirth, so I've heard. Amen. (laughs) Is because something good is coming down the pipe. She can endure because the pain will be worth it in the end as she celebrates the new birth of her child. She bears the suffering because of the joy before her. It is in weakness that God does his greatest 
birthing. Is there anyone in here this morning who's ever gone through something? You've been dogged out for speaking out. You've been lied about for standing out. You've been mistreated and misjudged because of your love for your God. But aren't you glad that even in our suffering, Jesus shows up? Hmm, God, he, he shows up and gives us a glimpse of what is to come, namely his glory. Paul is in bondage. He's in prison. Paul is talking about freedom while on lockdown. And the text says, but the word of God is not bound. Paul is saying, do to me whatever you desire. Imprison me, beat me, separate me, isolate me. And then he leaves and says, but what you ain't going to do is bind the word of God. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God lasts forever. Paul says, you can do whatever you want to me, but you will never lay a finger on God's word. I'm done. My time is up. We see Christ's victory. I said that three times already. We see Christ's victory. We see Christ's history. We see Paul's testimony. Look at verse 10. This is why I endure all things for the elect. So they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Final movement is this. We see Christ's glory. Christ's glory. Paul needs us to see the win. We go through down here to enjoy the Lord's glory up there. We endure. We are subject to so that our faith will spread, so that others will come to faith, so that the faithful will be encouraged all of that combining for his glory. Friends, when we keep the Lord's glory at the forefront of all that we do, it makes all of our challenges, all of our setbacks, all of our crises have a proper perspective. Remember I told you Christ makes chaos make sense. And right now, you're going through something that you never thought you'd go through. And you find yourself questioning your call, questioning why you made this sacrifice to come here. Christ makes chaos make sense. Glory here refers to the splendor of God and his divine presence. We live our lives unto his glory now to experience his glory and majesty and splendor later. Y'all, it's like an investment. It's, it's, it's a sacrifice that we give in the short term to reap dividends in the long term. So here's the question. Are you willing to go through to give him glory? Are you willing to endure to ensure his glory. Paul sacrificed his freedom and his life. Jesus sacrificed his heavenly throne to humble himself all for his glory. His father and son were passing a church in which the steeple had sustained some damage. The steeple that goes atop the church and it was down on the ground. And they were chiseling and refitting and improving. And the little boy, he asked his dad, he said, Dad, what, what are those men doing? He says, well, son, they, they're chiseling and whittling the steeple down here so that it'll fit up there. I need you to know that what you're going through right now, the pain, the, the challenges, the suffering, that's simply the Lord chiseling away the stuff down here so that you'll fit better up there. I know it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't, it doesn't seem that way. Why you're going through the suffering, the pain, the frustration is just the chiseling away down here to get us ready to experience his glory 
up there. Song says, oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past. Home at last. Ever to rejoice. Father, we thank you for the power of your word, for the clarity of your word. Thank you that we're able to understand that Christ makes chaos make sense. For those who are going through now and who will soon be going through, help us to be mindful that we suffer a little while, but we share in glory eternally. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.